Last time it worked uh, to use the uh, recording in the room, but today it's decided it's not. Although the last one, which you haven't seen yet, I think is all black and white. So that'll be entertaining. A little data science film noir or something. Um, so we're gonna cover uh, a number of things today uh, relatively quickly. Um, most of these are relevant for the midterm. So you know, if you don't catch it, I'll try to get the lecture notebook up as fast as possible. Um, but it's not too many things, um, but it is, uh, you know, it's got some, some complexity to it. So just a reminder that extra credit is still out there. Um, I saw at least as of yesterday, nobody had posted any. Um, so just remember those talks are going on. They are interesting. They are, um, depending on the, the speaker, um, theoretically targeted towards undergraduates. So they should be something you can follow without, you know, having a PhD in machine learning. Um, but uh, they, you know, so far I thought they've been pretty interesting. Uh, so we're gonna do the midterm on Thursday. It will be in this room. Uh, you will need a computer. Uh, so please make sure you have charged your computer beforehand. Um, when you come in, uh, we'll try to ask you to separate by like, uh, you know, make sure there's a seat on either side of you. I don't think everyone's gonna fit, so do what you can. Um, but do remember, try to fill in the middle first when you get here, uh, just to make it a little easier. Um, I'm hoping that the uh, content of the midterm will not necessarily be the whole class, um, but because it's on the computer, it will be, you know, kind of largely, you know, open, but, you know, like as an open web, but my goal is that the, uh, the questions, there's enough questions that if you're looking up every answer, you're not gonna be able to get it done in time. So please do study like that midterm review guide, um, everything that's in there, plus even a bit more than I'm actually planning on testing on is in that guide. Um, you know, take a look at the stuff you did in discussion last Friday. Um, you know, if that's helpful, uh, I think that was more structured to be kind of done in person or whatever. But the review guide, uh, I really like it. It was produced by uh, some students from this class last semester. Uh, so, you know, and if you feel like there's anything unclear, uh, remember we have office hours. Um, and then end of the day Friday is spring recess. Uh, you should have no homework and no labs or anything uh, due from us at least over that period. Uh, but then we'll be back in the thick of it uh, the following week. Uh, we are gonna try to make some changes to how the discussion section works. Uh, so watch for those when we post it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, I understand that there are a number of you who are concerned about kind of weather and choices about getting to class and things like that. Uh, please keep in mind, we have no control over whether or not BU decides to close. Um, I may look important, but I'm really not very, okay? So I have no control over it. Um, it is not uh, you know, a place to air grievances on our kind of communication mechanisms. I strongly encourage you to find the correct communication mechanisms. And if you disagree with the choices about whether the school's open, um, because I definitely think we can cover it on Zoom when there's weather, things like that, but that's just my personal opinion. Um, you know, find those channels, you know, work together with other students and you may be able to convince administration to make some different choices. Uh, but, you know, we're, we don't have a lot of control over it. Uh, if the school is announced as open, we will be holding things as normal. We may be able to make an accommodation for anybody who's unable to be there, um, but we may not. So just keep that in mind. But again, you know, just not the place to, to air those grievances. Yeah. Where would you recommend we start looking um, for a place to air? Uh, I would probably talk to um, the advisor of your department um, might be a good place to, to start. Um, and then, you know, but I'm sure there's various, you know, there, there's a ton of clubs at BU that would be good. Um, but I don't, I don't actually have a terribly great answer to that, except that um, the Dean of Students is, is who I would go to, but I might go by way of the advisor rather than direct. Um, but I've met the Dean of Students and I think they're very approachable. So, you know, you could certainly do that too. Um, so, but like I said, you know, no, uh, you know, no worries, like no, no general criticism or, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna bite you or anything like that. 
it's just we're trying to keep we try to keep that content uh related to the class all right everybody got it good all right anyone awake at all all right cool um so on we go uh first thing just a little bit of review um this is kind of the group or a pivot. Uh, so, you know, I showed this slide last time, um, but basically you get a combination of grouping variables per row. Um, you can have any number of them, right? So that's really can be very useful. Um, and I'll point out that that might be useful on the midterm, in fact. Uh, so uh, aggregating values of all of the columns in the table um, and then, you know, kind of a pivot table uh, and what that's used for, it's, you know, basically, it's a way of display. It's largely a way of displaying the data with getting rid of repeat information, so it's easier to understand. Um, but so those are the two comparisons. So hopefully uh, this slide's useful. Um, but I think it it tries to explain the the difference between the two concepts, even though in a lot of ways they're very similar. All right, and then joins. I know we were struggling with this a little bit last time. So just um, you know, a join is just saying I have two tables. And I want to connect them together. Okay, I want to make one table out of two. So I need a way to connect them that's logical. I can't just connect two random columns together. I need to connect two columns together that have that are the same thing. Um, and when I say the same thing, I really mean like the same thing, right? Um, you know, like Nero was a, an emperor, right? I mean, so if this was Nero, right, and that's Cafe Nero, those are not the same thing, even though they're the same word, right? So they need to be the same thing, and then you can group them together, uh, and you'll get one, not group, but you know, if you connect them together, then you can get one table uh, that is the combination of the two. Um, but keep in mind, no programming language or whatever is going to enforce that combining this and combining this into that is logical. Okay, that's a human component. That's a human judgment, right? The computer can't figure that out. So if you try to combine emperors and coffee shops, it's going to let you do it. Just the result's going to be really weird. Okay. All right. Um, and we have our cat picture to talk about control statements. And I can figure out how to make this work. All right, let me switch windows over here. Okay, so uh, first up, uh, a note of potential confusion. Um, control statements is kind of a general term, okay? Uh, and then you have uh, subsets of those, okay? So the first thing we're gonna talk about is conditional statements. And then we're also gonna talk about like looping statements. I can't remember what label I threw on there, but uh, the point is control statements basically are, instead of like, doing something, they control the flow of your application, okay? So instead of, you know, adding two numbers together or making a table, they control where the application goes. Um, and so a conditional statement is uh, exactly what it sounds like um, in that we do, we can either make one choice or another. Um, we actually have a lot more options than that, but to start off with, we're gonna talk about this. So for a little bit of background, hopefully I'll can read this. Um, so we're going to roll a die. If my number is bigger, you pay me a dollar. And if they're the same, we it's even, right? So we don't do anything. But if your number is bigger, I pay you a dollar. So now what we want to do is we're going to write a program to simulate that. And so we need to find a way to simulate two dice rolls, compute how much money we win or loss, um, and uh, do steps one and two 10,000 times. Okay. Which sounds like it would be unpleasant to do in the real world. At least for me. So we start off with our conditional. And so if you look at it, it looks a little bit like a defined statement, okay, except we're going to use the keyword if, okay. And basically, the way it's structured, actually, I'm just going to write this out so that it's clear. Hopefully, my spacing is good. So if this is true, then do this, okay? So we normally refer to this construct as an if then else, and we'll get to the else in a minute. Um, but basically, if it's true, we're gonna return a one uh, and that will be the result. 
And, oh, you know what? I forgot to run the opening. I'm just gonna make everything not work later. All right. Let me actually expand these. <clears throat> All right, so what's the outcome going to be here? Yeah. And you are correct. And then obviously this one is not going to come out correctly because here's the problem, right? What happens in the that's not true state? Well, it just returns nothing, right? So, um, you know, the computer is stupid. It's not going to just figure out that you have to return a zero. It has to, or you know, a negative one, which is probably the right answer here. So I'm gonna copy this from up here and make our function a little bit more sophisticated. Actually, let me just fix the tabbing for a second. Um, or not. Okay, so now I can do an else like that. And now the question is, what do I return in this scenario, right? So remember the rules are, if, I, if my roll is bigger, I get a dollar. If your roll is bigger, you get a dollar. And if uh, we're tied, we neither one of us gets anything. Right. So um, I'm taking this from the perspective of I'm playing the game, right? So therefore, a one means I get the dollar, a negative one means I owe a dollar, right? And a zero means I don't do anything. So to your point, right, we need a way to actually have a third condition, right? Because we can't just return zero or negative one sometimes. So we need to figure out what the right answer is. So we use a related construct, which is just like the if, except it's called an elif or expanded to be else if, okay? So this means if this fails, then we're going to go to the else, which is the other condition. But instead of going immediately into it, we're actually going to do if. So we could, if you think about it, right, we could actually just put another if statement here um, and put, I'm cheating so that I make less mistakes. Um, your role is greater than my role and return negative one, oops. So this would actually work, but it's a little ugly. So what we do is we kind of combine the pieces so that it's a little simpler. By doing a construct like this. So this and the other one work exactly the same way. In fact, underneath it probably will result in the exact same operations happening inside the computer, but this is a little easier to understand for you know somebody who's coming to look at your code. So if this test, if that fails, then we go to the else, but we're going to do it if that test. Um, and so, uh, and if that fails, then we go to the else, we return zero. Um, and that's basically all there is to it, except my spacing is wrong, so it may error. So I'm going to fix that real quick. All right, so now I have a new function that is slightly more sophisticated. And has a bug, or it's just thinking. Well, that's a feature. Oh, it got it eventually. Okay. Uh, so apparently this is some seriously complicated code. And by seriously complicated, I mean not complicated at all. Um, so, but I call this, right? And so I do one and one. And so obviously this fails and then this fails. 
So we get to the final else statement and we return zero. And then just to kind of round out our examples, we have, oops, fingers on the wrong key. Um, you know, my number was bigger than your number. So therefore I get a dollar um, and wow, this is impressively slow. All right, well, imagine in your head that it was quickly printing negative one, um, which would be that I owe a dollar, right? Because I lost. Oh, actually, no. So this one, yeah. So no, this one, it will still be one. I forgot what my example was. Um, the point is, even if I can, I can put any numbers in here I want, right? Because it's not actually doing dice rolling. We're just kind of making that assumption. Um, I was just thinking it said one, I thought. Um, so, but it still, it still works correctly, even if it's not a legal move in our dice game. All right. So let's move on to selection. And what we have here is another problem we need for our dice rolling, right? We need to be able to say, okay, I have a die. I want to throw a die and be able to get, you know, one of the sides of the die. But to make that a little simpler for discussion, we're going to say, okay, first, let's just make an array of mornings, okay? So whether we have to wake up, or if we have to, or we can sleep in. And so I'm just gonna make that array. But then we introduce a new feature called random. Oops. And assuming I typed that correctly. On NumPy, right, we can use this random thing, which then says, okay, give me a choice out of the set of morning's options, okay? And theoretically, that will be random every time. And so let's see what happens. Theoretically, we should get the same. Oh my God, why is this so slow? It shouldn't, but yes, I think that's related. Um, okay, so it will randomly choose one of them uh, as many times as I run that. So let's see because I kind of glossed over a couple things. Um, can't remember what I typed out, sorry. All right, so we'll just do this one. So, but it also has a cool feature in that I can um, tell it how many times to do it instead of just doing it one at a time, right? So I can say np.random.choice, nope, too late, yes mornings and I can tell it how many times I want it to do it. Okay, so now instead of getting back just the string from the array, I actually get back an array of seven of the uh, events as it were. Okay, so making sure my off by one errors aren't, aren't cropping up. Does this make sense so far? All right, so that's super handy, right? If we want to do a dice rolling game. Um, but we can also do, oh boy, uh, and this one I'm going to cut and paste because it's going to be a little bit faster to type. But we can also do comparisons here too, okay? So this seems a little weird, right? To sum up the number of wake-ups doesn't be like, what? So what that's doing is it's actually doing this comparison, okay, of wake-up and finding it in here, okay? for each one, when it compares it, if it found it, then it gets a one. If it didn't find it, it gets a zero. So therefore you can add them up or count them up in this case, but add them up and we will get the number of times wake up appeared in this poll of seven out of the morning. So it may or may not be whatever this was, one, two, three, four, because it's random every time. You have a question? Um, um, so I remember kind of vaguely um, very early on in the semester you mentioned, uh, you mentioned that computers are generally not able to do randomness. Yeah. How does it work with this then? Is it truly random or is it? So, so this is one of my pet peeves in computers, so I tend to talk about it a lot. Um, but random things on a computer are actually very difficult, right? Because everything 
is programmed, right? So it doesn't really know very much about how to do something that's random. Humans can do random things. It's actually harder than you think it is, but they can do it. So uh, in a lot of programming, that random is actually referred to as pseudo random, as in you actually, if you get down into the math of it, you know enough about how the language works, you can actually predict what it will be. However, a lot of modern implementations now actually do have some true randomness built in where what they do is they actually get access to something like the current temperature of the inside of the computer. Okay, so if you take that out to enough digits, right, that's a pretty random number because you don't, at any given time, you don't know exactly what temperature it'll be at. So that will be the number that feeds into your random number generator. And so then it does become truly random. So it's, uh, like I said, one of my pet peeves because we talk about randomness all the time. Randomness is very important to lots of parts of uh, mathematics and computer science and data science, yet we just kind of trust things like this and think that it is actually random. Um, but if most encryption, for example, is based on random number generation, if you can predict what the random number will be, your encryption fails. Okay, so uh, this is why it's one of my pet peeves. But long story short, it's random enough for most scenarios. Yeah. So if there are only a few ways to do like true randomness, is there a way you have, to have just complete and utter randomness? Like you would, for example, get to it. Know, well, that's what I was saying is that the like the temperature of the inside of the computer is truly random. So those things, yeah. If they if they can do it, yeah. But this is a this is a longer offline conversation. If you want to get into it, I am happy to get really uh, weirdly into it. Uh, but uh, you know, short version. Of okay. So in this case, what happened was, and I probably should have displayed what mornings was so that you would know how many. But in this case, the term wake up appeared in the array three times. Okay. And then, you know, we can kind of do the same thing and we'll probably get a different answer, right? But then we can also go the other direction and just give it the opposite. Um, and it still works. Okay. So what we're doing is we're trusting here about how this return result of this comparison works in that it becomes a number so that we can just add them up. All right. So and then the next examples are boring, so I'm not doing those. Um, all right. So Okay, so how many people here can, or anybody here can tell me how many faces are on, are on the on a typical die? Six, right? And so, inclusive, exclusive, right? There is, you know, and I think this is a common mistake for a programmer to make. There is no zero on a die, right? So we start at one, and then it's exclusive, so we end at seven. Okay. So how many faces are there actually on a die? Okay. Uh, all right, so did I execute that? No. Um, all right, so now we can combine our two little pieces of tool, or like this. Now we can use that to get our dies, or dice, sorry. And by choosing a die face, we get, you know, the, we, you know, we get three pips back. Um, so now we want to do something cooler, which I think I have. Oh, I actually wrote that out already. All right, so let's do this function here. Ah, so that we can simulate. Okay, so this is, we want to simulate those die rolls, okay? So how would we go about um, uh, simulating a single roll of, of 
both dice, right? So it's both my role and your role. So how do we do that? Right, open over here. Um, just call empty.random choice die basis twice. Basically, yeah. So, but I'm gonna actually provide the result, like the comparison as well in my little method here. Um, so yes, but I wanna store it so that I can keep it for a comparison. Five faces. Then I'm going to copy and paste that because I'm lazy. And we're going to call this your role. And then we can do, we can call our earlier function my role, your role. Oops, role. Right? So this is going to be one time of playing this game. Does this game sound like wicked boring? Yes, I agree, but you can get it. All right, so we're going to uh, pull a random choice off the die faces then for both myself and whoever I'm playing against. And then we're going to return the comparison uh, so that we can calculate a result. All right, and so in this case, I lost. I tried again and I won. Hey, look at that. It's like it's not random. Um, but it is ish. Okay, so that was the if statements, right? And then I want to introduce that random choice. Okay, both those things are important uh, things to know. Uh, we'll be using them both a lot this semester. Uh, but so there's if, you know, if else construct is the one you use most commonly. But then, okay, you know, occasionally you'll actually want to go at like a three way split, right? So it's if, l if, and else. Um, you can keep cascading those LFs if you want to make a, you know, a 20 way branch. Uh, usually it's a bad idea. There might be a better, more efficient way to, to write that application. All right. So now we're going to introduce this for loop. Okay. So a for um, is just like the English word as well. So for this thing in this array, do the following. So it's for, you imagine this and in some languages, you actually write this out, but for do okay so for this many times do this <clears throat> and in python we usually use a, like a shorthand so that we don't have to have like a separated counter from the thing we want to operate on so we do this trick where we say okay grab each pet in this array okay and now when you're down here your that pet will be one of those elements in the array <laughs> and so it will happen exactly array elements number of times, right? Because we did this in against the array and we put the, uh, the new pet right into this pet variable on each loop. So I love my cat, I love my dog, I love my rabbit. Make sense? All right. So for loop is a very, very handy construct. Um, you will use it a ton. And then what you can do is also, uh, sorry, I also want to show you a way, and I think we covered this already, but uh, if we didn't. Um, so if we have this array, okay, um, we can actually address individual pieces of the array by what's referred to as the index. Okay, so the zero if index, the first index, the second index. So it's still zero base. So what's happening here is it's basically counting through the items, but it's doing it kind of shorthand so you don't have to write it all out, right? So this should accomplish the same thing in a much less uh, like easy to type sort of way, right? Um, so kind of like you're doing a, creating a method, the for loop lets us collapse a, a construct like this into just a line or so of code. But that dot item addressing is also very handy uh, because sometimes you just want like, I want the 57th item out of it, right? All right. So let's do a small example of our game. 
Okay, so let's play the game five times. So what do you think I would do to do to play it five times? I mean, I can type it five times, but as you all know, I'm super lazy, so I'm not going to do that. So what would I do instead? All right. So we do MP range or A range. I try to say A range all the time because I think it's less confusing because I, I want it to be the word arrange. All right. And then we're going to collect our results into this variable here. The thing is, we can't put anything into this without it already being an array. So the first thing we do is we create it as an empty array, because otherwise we'll be trying to shove something into something that's not ready to take it. So I do game outcomes. Probably shouldn't risk that given how slow this is today. Um, and okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to append to my array, which is now an array, right? It's not just a blank thing. And we're going to append one round. And we're going to do that five times. And then for the sake of seeing what happens, we're going to print it. And so if I run this again, what will I get for a result? Something else, likely. Not necessarily, but likely. Um, because there's randomness in here. So as a result, if I keep running this, we'll get different results. All right. Then now, if I want to do my full test, right, that was from the beginning, and run it for a thousand times, was it ten thousand? Yes, you're right, ten thousand. One of my hardest problems in uh, programming is that you rarely get to be able to use commas and periods in a, in a number. And so counting the zeros all the time with no delimiters is very challenging. Um, okay, so sorry. So what I want to show you here is okay, so theoretically game outcomes has 10,000 elements now, right? It has 10,000 runs of the game. So when I print it, it uses this ellipsis, okay, or three dots, right? Um, so ellipsis means to be continued or missing. Uh, and so it's showing you basically the beginning of the array and the end of the array. So it doesn't want to print 10,000 uh, results. Okay, so instead to make sure it came out correctly, we just run len or length on the array. And that's how we prove that it has 10,000 attempts. Um, and then we of course care the most about how do we do, right? So what we can do is actually now take that array and put it into a table itself because it's just an array. And then we can see how we did. Why do I have, oh, uh, so this was a starter. Um, but we can now group the results by width. Oh. And then if I was going to use a graph to display the results, what would you recommend? A bar chart, a bar chart. yeah. All right, I'm going to use the horizontal one again, just like I said, for display reasons mostly.
and we can see how I did, right? So what I think is kind of interesting. So we're actually wait, that's really close, but it looks like I lost by a hair, right? Um, but if I did it again, right, I would get a different result. Except probably not, right? I would probably actually get a pretty similar result because there's only so many outcomes. And we'll talk about that later. All right. So that leads us to what's referred to as a simulation, okay? And so what we just did was kind of in the formal terminology, a simulation, okay? So we simulated rolling a die 10,000 times um, with probably fairly good accuracy, okay? Of what would actually happen in the real world. So we're gonna do a little bit more experimentation with that. And we're just gonna have now, uh, you know, the simple coin flip, okay? And we're going to do what we did before, which is just, let's see if, you know, do we get heads or tails, right? And so we can run that, oops. And then we can make it slightly more sophisticated by let's say we do it 10 more or 10 times at once, right? And then we can kind of keep doing the same thing that we were doing before by looking at how we did and actually just comparing it to one or the other. Um, and then, and the reason I'm showing this is because this is something you're gonna to wanna to be able to do pretty regularly. But so we can see for this random sample of outcomes, you know, where we took, we flipped the coin 10 times, we got tail six times. And I'll just count it here, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. We also got six heads. Is that the expectation that you have? What, what do you feel like we should get for this number here. Why? Because there's only two choices, right? So it's 50-50 chance. So we should get five. Any theories as to why we didn't get five? I'm asking. We don't have a big enough sample. Exactly. So we only did it 10 times. And so it's not gonna be necessarily evenly distributed. Yeah. Right. So we're going to talk about that in more detail later. Um, but we, but yes, if we ran it 10,000 times, we still may not get a 50 50 distribution. Um, but it's a lot more likely that we will. Okay. Um, and the reasons for that we'll talk about, I don't think in this lecture, but in a future lecture. Okay, so let's kind of just build up on what we were doing before or, or similar. I'm just trying to figure out where my cheat sheet is here. All right, so heads in 100 tosses. So we're going to return. Oops. We're going to do this correctly. All right. So how can I kind of in one go figure out how many heads I got and after flipping a coin 100 times? What do you all think? Or do you have it right behind you? No, sorry. <laughs> right here. What's that? But I want the total. Sum it, right. So we sum choice outcomes. Oh, 
And assuming I type that correctly, it's just like we did before. Um, and I, I find you know kind of asking these questions in class is difficult, right? Because like the you know the the innermost part is the part we really care about, right? And it gets outer is, is how we, we kind of build it, but it's hard to talk about it that way. So if we do this, now we have a function that will run it a hundred times. Um, and so we'll be able to get a sample. But then we can incorporate oops, our for loop and get really crazy. And we'll do another 10,000, not 100,000, because I don't have the rest of my life. Results. And all right. And so now it's going to think for a second because reasons. Um, and so now we get, you know, whatever, 100 times 10,000 results, right? So if we look, sorry, let me just do. Oh, that's probably risky. So then we get oh oh sorry. Um, so now we've gotten ten thousand samples of a hundred coffees. Okay, so you would expect that if we kind of average those out, right, that would probably be close to fifty. All right, so then we can shove all that into a table and then we can do other kinds of operations like a histogram. And hey, look at that. Um, so what we end up with is a distribution that's what is generally referred to as pretty close to normal, okay? And a normal distribution, um, and I always start with this because I want normal to be like straight, Right? But a normal is a curve that kind of looks like this. So if the center is kind of where you expect it to be, uh, which would be 50 50 in this case, but obviously it's a lot more useful when we don't know what we expect it to be. Right? Uh, so, but if we can get a normal distribution, then we know that kind of in the middle ish is where the most common result is going to be. All right. So now we go back to the slides. We'll talk about that a little more formally. All right, so. Wait, what's that problem? 445, right? Uh, okay, so control and conditionals. So we have if and for um, are control statements. Um, you know, like I say, control is kind of the, the overall terminology, and conditional is like. If and for, um, there's other kinds of control statements as well. Um, if is to basically allow you to do branching, right? And then for is allow you to do the same thing over and over and over again. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's a difficult question. So in the sense that you can often just give no bins at all, and the history is going to come out pretty well. Okay. In this case, I'm trying to show something specific, so I kind of picked up somewhat arbitrarily. But normally, what you want to do is you want to look at the minimum and the maximum of the values, and then kind of pick bins that are in that range that evenly distribute ish the the result. So if you if your range, let's just say, was from you know uh, fifty to one hundred and fifty, um, you might pick bins that are let's say twenty. Okay, so that you know that the the ranges are all kind of like you'd expect them to be roughly the same. Um, so that's fairly typical. 
this is more because I'm showing it to you rather than because it's necessarily the best choice. Okay, has anybody ever heard of the Monty Hall problem? All right, you wanna, you wanna tell me what it is? Don't tell me the answer though, just tell me what it is. Okay, so there's a, there's a key component that you missed, which is that one of them has like a good prize, the other two have not good prizes. Okay, uh, the typical example is that you have a car and two goats. I don't know what the Monty Pearl problem has against goats exactly, but they are the not prize. Okay, so the question is basically uh, let me just see what my next slide is. Yeah. So the, basically the question is, um, I chose one or two in this scenario, okay? So I can choose one, two, or three, but let's just say for the sake of argument, I chose door number one, okay? So the host of the show shows me what's behind door number three, okay? Now the question is, I now have more information, right? So I know there's a goat behind this door, all right? Before I saw that, does anybody know what the probability of getting the right answer is? Yeah, one in three, okay? So now I know there's a goat here. What should I do? Should I choose, like, or should I stick with my original choice, which is number one, or should I switch to number two? The, the first part of your answer is correct. The second part is not. All right, any other? Go ahead. Right, because now you've revealed a door, the probability hasn't changed to be 50 50. It's actually hasn't changed, but the amount of information you have has gone up. Does that make sense? This is why this is such a good problem because it's confusing, right? Um, because now it's two out of three that you will get the right answer. Because the original, because uh, you now have more information about the original choices, but the choices haven't changed. Yeah. If you're choosing between two doors, though, I, I might just be misunderstanding here, but wouldn't it still be a 50 50 shot? 50 percent one step? But one that's the door? thing. So that's the whole point of this exercise. You're not choosing between three, two doors, you're actually choosing between three still. So, because effectively it's still the same the probability. If you want the math, I recommend taking a look at it, but it ain't it ain't cheap math. Um, so, uh, but yes, the, like that's why this is such a good example because the temptation is now the probability has switched, which it hasn't. Okay, all right. So. Theoretically, we have some goats. And so I'm not going to show you the math, but I'm going to show you why it's true. Okay. So basically, here are all the scenarios that are possible, right? I chose goat one, or I chose goat two, or I chose the car. The reveal was goat two, goat one, or goat one, two. Okay. And then the other choice is the other choice. All right, so why don't we model it, right? And then we can figure out what the answer is without having to do the mathematical proof. So the first thing we do is make our set of doors, right? And then, sorry, I lost my cheat sheet. Okay, and then we're gonna figure out what happens when I choose something. So, goats. And keep in mind, right, one of the keys to this is that the host is never going to reveal the car, right, because the host knows where the car is. Ah, sorry. So basically, we want to model like this scenario up here, right? So uh, return second goat. 
and then if nope oh if turn so when the selection is made right um, if the selection was the first goat, then you return the second goat. If it's the second goat, even though I typed it wrong, you return the first goat. Yeah. Right. They'll never reveal the car. Yeah. Oh, too many equal signs. Where? Oh, it's two double equals. Sorry. Not, not only was I not seeing it, I also wasn't understanding you explaining it. <clears throat> okay, so that looks right. Okay, so obviously if we call first goat, it will return with second goat. Um, and does anybody have any idea what will happen here? Okay, so this is something to kind of point out, right? And uh, in these examples, uh, they are not really following one of the best practices, which is that you should never be able to get out of a method without a return, okay? So even if you want that return to be nothing, like none or something, then you should have a return statement that says none, okay? You should always be able to look at the code, at the method, and know what's going to happen in all cases. In this case, we did if and elif, but we didn't do it else. And we also didn't do anything at the method level to say return something. Okay, so if you give it garbage, it's just going to return nothing, which may or may not be what the consumer of your method uh, is expecting. Okay. Uh, so now let's write the Monty Hall game method which in the interest of time, I'm going to cut and paste. I apologize. Assuming I can figure out how to cut and paste. And I'm gonna fix the spacing. All right, so this is kind of a, the whole scenario, right? So the contestant chooses it random. As far as the contestant's concerned, he has no idea what's behind the door, right? So essentially, it's a random choice. Um, then if the contestant chooses the first goat, then Monty's going to reveal. Oh, does anybody know who Monty Hall is? Okay, so Monty Hall was the game show host of, shoot, that's quite the name of the game show. Uh, let's make a deal. Uh, and so the problem is actually named after the host, not after the show. But uh, he's been dead for quite some time, I believe. Um, and hopefully, I didn't just cause him to be dead. Um, but so if the, if the contestant chose the second goat, then this month is going to show you the first goat, and the last door has the car, you know, as it's made. Um, but Monty's choice, this one is slightly interesting, right? In that if you actually chose the car, Monty gets to pick which of the goats to reveal. <laughs> So if we want a simulation, then we see the contestant in this particular run chose the second goat, Monty revealed the first goat, and the last door has a car. Okay, so in that case, you shouldn't have stuck with it, but you didn't know that at the time because you still ended up with the goat. All right. So now let's make a table that has these various scenarios so that we can actually try some stuff out, right? So now we're going to do basically the same thing, except uh, we're going to do it 3,000 times using our cool for loop. And by cool, spoken as a true nerd. 
And so now we have 3,000 different scenarios. Well, lots of repeat scenarios, right? But we have 3,000 different times that the game was played. So now, we can look at how it did, which I think might already be here. Nope. By using our group function, we can now say, hey, look, right? The remaining door was the car for 2016 times. So in other words, like it's, it's you know, it, a lot of people didn't get the car. Um, and so lastly, and then we can also leverage our bar chart to kind of get the same thing as a picture. But if you notice, I grouped it and then I did the bar chart. Um, and, but let's go back to the slides and talk about the probability. Um, the we're almost out of time. So, if the probability is zero, that means it cannot happen, right? At all. That's what zero probability means. If it's one, that means it must happen or it will happen, okay? So the chance of the event is certain. Um, and normally when we talk about probability, we do it in terms of percentages. So think about it as zero and 100% chance, okay? Uh, but those numbers are the same, right? The complement is an event that has, uh, is the it, like inverse of the probability. So if an event has a 70% chance, then the complement is 30%, okay? And the reason we bring that up is because sometimes it's easier to calculate the complement than it is to get the, the real probability. So if you can get to the complement, right, then you can always get to the probability. Ooh, a question. Uh, so top hat should be working now. Let's see if it is. Is it working for anyone? Oops, some people answered. Oh, sorry, what is the highest value of uh, probability? Mildly trick question here. All right, it seems like it was working for most people, which is good. The company did not lie to me. I'm gonna call it there though, uh, so we don't completely run out of time. All right, so why, why did I say this was a mildly trick question? Because it's 100% not 100%. Right, this number is not 100%, okay? This number is 100%. So just keep in mind if the, you know, that decorator isn't there, it's a different number. All right, so to calculate probability, assuming that all the outcomes are equally likely, the chance that it will happen is the number of outcomes that make A happen and the total number of outcomes, okay? One divided by the other. And that's how you get to the probability. Um, in mathematics, uh, as you may or may not know, uh, there's often certain letters that always indicate the same thing. And we'll use a few of those. And so if you see a capital P like that, it almost always means probability, okay? Not necessarily, but most of the time. So number of outcomes that make A happen, number of outcomes in general. So when we're talking about the Monty Hall problem, you try to get the car, right? Then the number of outcomes that are possible or that, uh, that you want for your scenario, right, is one. The possible outcomes are three. So it's one over three. All right, another question. They started? Yes. All right. So, what is the numerator? I may remember what a numerator is for determining probability of A and number of outcomes that make A happen, and the total number of outcomes are the choices.
All right, calling it. So the numerator is the number of outcomes that make A happen. I don't know why, but this has always been something easy for me to remember. Um, for some reason, numerator sounds like it's on the top and denominator sounds like it's on the bottom. I don't know why, take it or leave it, uh, but that's why the numerator is on the top. Okay, so now the multiplication rule. Okay, so this is when you want to combine events together, right? And this is the scenario that we have with the Montreal problem where you're multiplying it together. So the answer, uh, sorry. So the, the first thing is A happens, right? And B happens given that A has happened. And so the answer is less than or equal to each of the two chances being multiplied. Oh, sorry, this is not the Montreal problem. Um, so basically, this is like, okay, you want a cascading effect, okay? Sorry, I was thinking of the wrong one. Um, so when you have, uh, you know, like I, I have, uh, you know, oh, the ice cream smoke, right? So I chose a, a flavor of ice cream, okay? And I got chocolate back. And what's the probability that I will also now get, you know, strawberry, right? So if I'm going into it, I want a chocolate and a strawberry cone. So I want two different outcomes. It's kind of like combining the probabilities, right? So that's what you do with the multiplication rule. And so if you, basically the thing to remember, if you have multiple conditions to satisfy, the um, probability of that happening is gonna go down, right? Um, you know, so if it's my chocolate cone and any cone, that's not gonna be as bad a problem as my chocolate cone and my strawberry. That makes sense? So that's the multiplication problem. Um, and the, like the, the way you calculate it is with multiplication or the multiplication rule rather not problem. All right. My guess is there's a question about probability. Ah, shoot. Let me kind of back up. Oh yeah, there you go. Sorry. I, I clicked the go forward one too many times. All right, call it there. Uh, all right, so when you're multiplying them together, it's you're adding basically conditions on your scenario. So it's going to be harder for it to happen. Okay, so the probability will be less or closer to zero than if you had either one of them separate, right? All right, so if event A can happen in exactly one of two ways, then we add it together. So this is the addition rule. So this is a, this is a more positive scenario. Um, I'm gonna think of a good example. Um, but basically, if you, if you have multiple outcomes and it basically goes up because you've like increased the, the field of options that result in a good result. That makes sense. Um, so you know, it's kind of like you're all two dice, right? And uh, in your probability of getting any number and getting any number, if you're much more likely to have that happen than if you want a three and a uh, five, right? Um, in fact, any number and any number is going to be, well, really close to 100% chance. But that's the idea. So if I'm gonna, if I'm going to put if I'm reducing conditions by saying Actually, I could use the three example. So I roll a three and then any number, that's going to be a much higher probability than a three and a five. Makes sense, right? Because I'm, I'm opening up the field of options. Okay, so another question.
Control 3 here. All right, calling it there. Close enough. And so if you're doing the addition rule, if you're adding the probabilities together, the chances are going to go up. All right. Okay, so complement again, um, this is just kind of the inverse of the actual probability. Um, so in three tosses, we have any outcome except tails three times. Okay. So that's why we call it like the complement. It's the inverse um, because it's the probability of that event is one eighth. Um, but it's a, a little easier potentially to calculate getting at least one head, right? Because if we get one head on our heads and tails tosses, then this is impossible. Right, so that might be easier to calculate. So as a result, it's often, um, you know, like you look for the cost, and then in ten tosses, whatever. But that's the idea. All right. So the biggest thing to remember about the complement is that when you're trying to calculate a probability, it's often easier to get the other way. But be careful with it because make sure you have the complete other way. So the temptation here, for example, is to not calculate the probability of at least one head, but just a head, right? Um, so which would also be relatively low probability. Uh, so you just want to be careful of making sure that you're actually covering the whole other side of this field. All right. Um, we did a lot of sampling. So let's talk about this real quick. Um, Although I don't, I'm only going to cover this kind of sort of midterm, so it's it's totally fine. The taking of samples is there, but not the types of samples. So I will talk about a random sample versus kind of non-random samples. So this is the idea of uh, like, for example, let's say I'm taking a poll of people who work for the city of Boston. Okay. And let's say I want to, um, you know, part, part of the question is, did I get a random sample of people who work for the city of Boston or not, okay? And they work elsewhere because I want to know where people work. Let's say I stand outside a grocery store and ask, do you work for the city of Boston or do you work elsewhere? And is that a good place to try my survey out? What do you think? Is a grocery store, standing outside a grocery store, a good place to ask random people and say, do you work for the city? Do you not work for the city? Yeah. Why? Um, right. So because most people go to grocery stores, there's a pretty good chance that the people you have coming out of there are going to work in random places. What if I went outside of city hall and asked the same survey? Is that a good place? No, because most people who go to city hall work there. Right. Um, well, I should probably think about my example because people go to city hall for lots of reasons besides going to work, like paying parking tickets and getting permits and stuff. So, but you get the idea. It's just a stupid example. Um, so, one of the big problems in sampling data or in trying to get survey data, right, is ensuring that the data that you think is random is random. Okay. So, in other words, that you didn't stand outside of city hall and ask if you work you know, for the city, but instead stood outside of a grocery store. So you need to be able to, you need to be careful to think about where your random sample is coming from to ensure that it is actually random. Um, and that can be a big challenge. Um, so by way of kind of uh, formal discussion or whatever, so sampling basically means, well, I can't ask everyone in the world where they work, right? So what I do is I take what's called a sample. I pull out a group of you know, survey respondents or whatever to try to make a guess about the overall population. And let's say in this scenario, what I'm trying to figure out is 
the people who live in Boston, what percentage work for the city? Okay, that's the question I'm trying to answer. I can't ask everyone who lives in Boston, so I'm gonna pull a sample. So formally we call those samples and you have different kinds of sampling. You can do random sampling, you can do manufactured, et cetera. 